Once there was a boy who dug a hole in the ground and found a telescope full of dirt. Being underground so long meant the telescope didn't work so well. When the boy looked through the lens, all he saw was soil with worms wiggling and clumps of old moss. This made the boy sad, even though he didn't know why. He'd never seen a telescope before. The stars in the sky were evil, a sin, the souls of of long-lost devils dancing naked in the dark. To look at the stars was forbidden, punished by being locked inside a black coffin forever. So, not knowing what to do, the boy hid the telescope in the woods. He pointed its mouth to the sky and went home. If he couldn't watch the stars, then at least the broken mystery thing could. A great storm raged through his village that night and blew the roof off the church and put out the flame in the lighthouse. The lighthouse keeper doused himself in kerosene and set himself ablaze on top of the tower staring at clouds and lightning, trying with all his might to shine like the stars he could never gaze upon. The next day at the funeral, the boy snuck away, worried about his telescope, but he found it still standing, unharmed, now with a small sprout growing out of the funny tube's mouth. He kept the sprout a secret, And every day, when he was done with school and his chores, the boy went out to the woods with a small pail to water the plant. Until one day, the plant had the sturdy stem of a great flower ready to bloom. The boy snuck out of his house one night to watch the flower grow. As darkness came over the land, the flower unfolded, and at its center, was a white bulb, swirling and glowing with all the light from the stars overhead. The boy's mother caught him with the flower in his hand, his head held up to the sky. And so, they locked the boy inside that black coffin, where he would have to stay forever. But flowing through that flower were all the stars drained straight from the sky. He stole away the stars from those too afraid to look at them. And they they would would never never even even know. know. I don't know what to say. I feel something, but, but I don't know what the feeling is. There isn't a word for it. The emotion at the end of the story, the girl who told it. A hundred guppies watch from the aquarium tank, already judging me for trying to speak for ruining this moment with the concrete brick of spoken word. So, I just stare at the ceiling, like the brave boy and his telescope, searching for something the rest of the world has condemned to make it my own. And what I find are constellations, painted in their dotted hieroglyphs, connected by straight lines, telling all their lies. Taper Man is similarly affected by the story. He's entered the amphitheater, heard the tale. I can tell he's sobbing inside his mascot costume. Pathetically so. Allie's ignoring him, pretending he's not there. And this is drawing Taper Man closer to her. 
He needs something from her that she's never going to give him. I can tell. He's never been brave enough to see the stars. And now, they've been sealed away forever. They are hers to keep. On my belt is a hard metal case. Dented and dirty, but still there. Its contents intact. A syringe. A hypodermic needle. <sighs> I take it out, and there's no going back. Shh. I'm quiet. A shadow pulled in the corner, spilling down the stairs. An angel diving talon first out of a cloud. Shh, 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 shh. I'm slinking right behind him. Spot the gap between velvet helmet and shoulder. And I push the needle of my syringe into Mr. Taper's neck. Inject him with a concentration of chameleon saliva and brain matter from what I hope is his own hippocampus. Ooh. The scenery smears. Blurred paint on a canvas inside a wind tunnel. The museum rotates and clanks, tile by tile into position. True position. The bizarre exhibits morphing into the commonplace. The sensical. Just regular old dinosaur skeletons. Anatomical dioramas. A scent of polished pine saw marble, fresh vacuumed carpet, a more appropriate sense of echo. I can see city streets through the entrance, the parking lot, people on cell phones and hailing cabs. I'm in the lobby. Families purchase tickets, pass through turnstiles. Behold the center of the museum, which showcases the main exhibit, Nova Primordia. It's a crater that bubbles and gurgles with green brine, like a tide pool and a fountain combined. The exhibit claims to be a new primordial soup, the beginnings of new life on Earth, if all extant lines of evolution were to run their course, die out. Leave not a scrap of DNA, RNA, or microbial froth behind. Amphibial terrors, burble, burp, rise and sink on hydraulic pistons. A gummy lobopod circumambulates the pool with a mohawk of sticky spines wobbled along its slender caterpillar body. Hallucigenia my favorite extinct organism. I won't go into detail about how badly I want to jump in the pool and lick it. <laughs> this is the museum as it should be. It's a true memory. An actual reconstruction of time and space and occurrence. I have time traveled. Space traveled. I, I've always been here, in this moment, forever and always. 
I could walk through the exit. Live a whole other life if I wanted to. <laughs> but I'm not going to. The show's just getting started. Having fired the imagination of a generation, the space shuttle pulls into port for the last time. I see the rocket ship part the plastic drapes of a special entrance, bring a host of new patrons into the museum. Taper Man is the driver, still adorned in the museum's full mascot uniform. He has a field trip in tow. You know, kids swinging lunchboxes, more excited to be out of school than to actually learn anything. And, uh... There's a couple leaning against a stone column, and Allie's with them. I guess it's her mom. She bends over, kisses her on the cheek, and Allie takes off, skipping, skipping actually, headed for Taper Man. The couple begins to grope each other, make out a little as soon as she skips away. Mr. Taper takes his head off. He, uh, he knows her. Allie. Hey, Mr. Taper. How's the space shuttle treating you? A little shaky, to be honest. I think this old rocket needs to head back to the hangar for a tune-up. You better take care of the spaceship, or else the astronauts will come for you. Silent, hungry, Pfizer teeth. <laughs> Interesting way of putting it, Miss Alexandra. Man, am I weird. At least you didn't see a dead cat on a table before. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. Well, happy birthday, my little astronaut. Thanks, Dad. Is everyone ready for takeoff? <laughs> Roger that. Five. Slow motion. Alexandra kicks her leg out to the side of the rocket with each number counted. The Nova Primordia exhibit drips, jettisons bile, feigning a birth to erase all births that came before. The horny couple? Alexandra's mother, uh, whoever the overly enthusiastic groper is, she kisses them on the cheek and gives Mr. Taper a middle finger from across the atrium. And I see it all. The divorce, custody disputes, drained bank accounts, title and name changes, the weekend parking lot drop-offs, and Alexandra out on the roof on a cold night eye to a telescope, as far away from the yelling downstairs as she can be. Mr. Taper floors it, his soft hoof stomps on the pedal, and the spaceship blasts off, wheels course correct, skid, gain traction with Allie's leg still kicked out to the side as the vehicle veers, careens at high speed, scrapes along the exhibit, and a primeval terror lurches out of the acid in an explosion of green, glittering water. Its animatronic mandibles catch the softness of Allie's leg, tasting something it was never meant to taste. The most forbidden of all snacks. She's ripped from the shuttle, leg bent like a question mark, punctuated by her head dangling in the air. She doesn't scream, but Taper Man does. He tucks and rolls out of the driver's seat, but the spaceship keeps going, the costume's fabric caught in the pedal, accelerating us faster almost on two wheels as we follow some invisible arc on a crash course with the tide pool crater. The third grade field trip has turned into a pool party.
Hey. Hey. Give me your hand. Come here. Come on. Come on, man. Now we'll get it. <sighs> We're out of the primordial soup. <clears throat> right by Allie. We're not going to the moon today. She's out of it. But me and Taper Man, we're <clears throat> straddling the point of fracture in his psyche. Demarcated by a fracture in his daughter's leg. Not a compound fracture. I don't see any bone or, or blood. It's nothing like that. It's a small crack. But one that will start the division of continents through emotional plate tectonics. Shearing the most important relationship of his life. Mr. Taper watches his shuttle sink like a juice box to the bottom of the crater fountain. The end of this moment arrives, like a librarian finishes a book among flaming rows of archive. Of a sudden, all layers of memory, the real world, they collapse into a tunnel. A bridge from the deepest trench of Taper Man's soul, all the way back to the nesting zone. And he stands up to behold the totality of original sin, walking along the crater. He sees me, and it is known that I am the one responsible for this. of smoke burn in clean lines around the museum. It's space shuttles launching into the air. The pond bulges, and two gigantic gloved hands grip the animatronic monstrosities. The queen of all astronauts rises from the water, hollow and white-suited and covered in bright green scum. The rocket ship transport floats inside her helmet, kids and all, while cyanobacterial gush pours from the visor, and the roar of a new universe expanding splits the atrium, the sky from horizon to horizon like a great eyelid. If there is a god, it is no longer sleeping. The astronaut's fist raises to crush me, and, and I see no point in drawing my sword. I won't survive this. <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna survive this. Instead, I, I hold Allie's hand. Pretend we're inside that black coffin from her story. Dreaming of a drained sky. Staring into a star-pulsed flower. Telling each other stories that will shape the constellations trapped inside. Myths that will determine the lineage of emperors. And social caste systems for civilizations a billion years in the future. Over the turnstiles is a horned albino chameleon, crouched and humming. Atop the reptile's spine stands a naked woman, wearing a black knight's helm and a black cape. She holds an ivory lance. It's clearly been carved from one of the chameleon's missing horns. And she's impaled Mr. Taper on its shaft. Behind the naked knight is a levitating sphere of lizard embryo, 
drooling thick blood and waterfall out of a prenatal mouth curled inwards on nubs of developing forelimbs as its blind cone eyes twitch with unconscious suffering. Clearly the aftermath of sexual reproduction turned into device and instrument. Electricity volts down the chameleon's tongue and boils the water inside the astronaut, vaporizing its insides. Rays of light split the spacesuit seams. The hearts of children flash into static, bright enough to turn jungles into sand. Museum goers are disintegrated, transmuted to moon dust. Steam billows from the open visor, the shapes of circus animals lolling about its thick mist. Mr. Taper slides off the woman's lance onto the marble tile, evaporating cell by cell. The albino chameleon retracts its tongue and uh, head tilted, watching me, begins to eat him. I find my hand squeezing the plastic soda bottle on my belt, crunching the sharp and decayed things inside. Yeah, I know who this woman is. She slides her night helm back and, and now I'm sure. I, I, I'm sure. I found who I'm looking for. This is Eleanor. <laughs> this is my sister.